So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Edgar. Uh, what is your uh, surname? Pronounce? Uh, Shigolian is fine. Shigolian. Okay, sorry. And uh, have you shifted to University of Pennsylvania? Yes, yeah. Just like as a professor. Ago. Sorry? As a professor. Uh, no, no, as a fellow. As a fellow. Okay. So, uh, uh, okay. So, we are welcoming Edgar in our uh, research uh, Zoominar platform, QASTM. And today it is 50th talk. And thanks, Edgar, for giving this uh, talk for us. And he's in Pennsylvania right now. And those who don't know about Edgar, just I want to point uh, a few uh, things. His research interest is quantum gravity, black holes, quantum cosmology, uh, quantum information theory, CFTs and all. And uh, he did his uh, 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 BS mathematics from University of California, Berkeley. Then he did his PhD from Stanford with Professor Leonard Susskind. Then he was uh, a postdoc fellow at University of California, Santa Barbara from 2014 to 17. Then he uh, works with Tom Hartman in the Simons Bootstrap collaboration. And presently he shifted to University of Pennsylvania. And uh, congratulations for that. And uh, uh, we are all welcoming you from Potsdam. So uh, you can start from your end. All right, thank you for that nice introduction. Thanks for, for having me. So um, I am gonna talk about uh, several, several papers and little subsets of them and try and give an overview, at least from my perspective and most of the things I've been thinking about of black holes, the information paradox, islands and, and sort of what it all means. And so I was told that this is a you know two hour plus half hour uh, format. Um, so I'll just kind of keep going. There's a fair amount of content, but people should interrupt and ask, ask questions uh, whenever they feel like it. So I'll start off by talking about uh, this paper from last year, which was a paper about replica wormholes and how you can use them to derive a, a unitary page curve. That was in this paper here. And I know that there are um, some masters and PhD students. We also wrote a review, this one here, that goes through the ideas in this paper uh, much more slowly, much more carefully, and talks a lot about some of the sort of philosophy and history behind, uh, behind what's going on. Then I'll talk about this uh, paper with Tom Harmon and Andy Sraminger, which was uh, basically extending the ideas um, from this paper to situations where you have black holes and asymptotically flat space time. And then I'll talk about this paper with Tom Harmon and Yukun Jiang about um, sort of islands more generally and in particular in the context of cosmology. And then I'll end with some uh, discussion of some sort of ongoing work which you can uh, roughly think about as uh, asking the question, you know, what does it all mean? Um, so I'll get started. I'll have a sort of brief overview and, and, and please ask me questions at this stage because this is uh, sort of trying to set the background and um, conceptual framework for the, the information paradox. So the, the basic history is in the 70s, you know, Hawking did this uh, calculation I'm sure everyone is, is familiar with and introduced sort of the information paradox. And the calculation that he did is he considered a situation where you uh, create a black hole by collapsing a pure state of matter, and then you let it evaporate by emitting Hawking radiation, and then you compute the entropy of the radiation, okay? So Hawking did that computation and he found this green curve here. He found that the entropy goes up and up and up and up until the black hole is fully evaporated over here and then it saturates. Can't really go up after that. And he pointed out that, um, you know, if you start off with a pure state, then the entropy of the full global state should be zero. That's the definition of a pure state. And what he seemed to find is that the entropy at some later time, assuming the black hole sort of completely evaporates, um, 
is finite. And the entropy of the radiation is the entropy of the global state at the end if the black hole completely evaporates. So what you seem to find is pure states evolve into uh, mixed states. And to sort of really make the statement, we're assuming that the entropy of a black hole is given by A over four and that it evaporates kind of completely leaving no entropy in particular, that there are no remnants. Um, so if you assume that there are no remnants, then this curve tells you that pure states must evolve into mixed states. Okay, and that's not good. We in quantum mechanics want pure states to evolve into pure states. So there seems to be uh, a puzzle. Okay, the next uh, important step in the story was a computation by Don Page, where he argued what the curve for the entropy of radiation should look like in an actual unitary theory. And it's this purple curve. So we can quickly talk about a few of the features. You know, it sort of tracks uh, Hawking's curve for the early stage of the evaporation. The most important feature, of course, is that it goes back down to zero. So this means that you start off with a pure state and you end with a pure state. So in a unitary theory, this is what we expect. And he also, you know, uh, clarified other features of it. For example, as I said, it follows Hawking curve at early times and at later times it follows the thermodynamic entry of the black hole, so A over four. And it has some kind of little sharp turnaround here, which is called the page time. And that occurs when the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole is equal to the entropy of the Hawking radiation. That's what's called the page time. So Edgar, does I have a question. This turnaround is very sharp or smooth? Um, I mean, it, it, it's smooth as like um, in, in, a, in a functional sense. I mean, in the computations I'll talk about, mm -hmm. uh, because I won't do an exact computation, it'll look sharp. But it's expected if you do the full computation that it's actually some smooth turnaround. There isn't like a, uh, it's not actually a sharp corner. Okay. So it's, it's kind of smooth as drawn. But we'll, we'll come back to that actually in a few slides. Good. So that became the target of uh, something, something to calculate. And people are maybe aware that there was a flurry of activity on this, on this question last year. And it started with these papers, uh, one by Jeff Pennington, and then another by Amin al Mary, Ned Engelhardt, um, Don Rolf, and Henry Maxfield, uh, computing this curve uh, from holography. It was some setup in ADS-CFT, or a slight kind of modification of ADS-CFT. And assuming uh, that holographic setup, they showed how you could compute this, this curve for the, for the radiation. And then later in the year, those papers um, showing how you can compute this curve uh, not by assuming holography, but by assuming the validity of the Euclidean path integral. And at the very end of the talk, I'll circle back to uh, how different an assumption that really is. Okay, so those um, are papers showing how to compute this. And we're going to start, I'm going to start off this talk talking about the computations from the point of view of the Euclidean path integral. And then I'll ask, you know, what are the lessons? What about uh, for flat space if you don't have? Uh, sort of black holes in anti space spacetime, which are what these papers were concerned with. Uh, what about cosmology? And you know, what does it all mean? Okay, any questions about this basic setup? All right, let's keep going then. So I'll introduce um, the model that many of the papers from uh, last year considered. And it's a model of uh, gravity in one plus one dimensions. It's a dilaton gravity model, meaning it has a metric degree of freedom and it has a scalar degree of freedom. Okay, the reason we do that is because it's called Jacob Teitelbaum gravity. The reason uh, we do that is in one plus one dimensions. If you wrote down the pure um, Einstein-Hilbert action, which looks like this, uh, it's purely topological. It's equal to the Euler character of the manifold. So there's no there's no local degrees of freedom. It's a purely topological theory. And that's not very, I mean, it's still an interesting model, uh, but you want something a little bit richer to really discuss black holes and uh, black hole evaporation and things like that. So in addition to a pure Einstein-Hilbert type term, uh, which is multiplied by some constant called phi naught, and you keep tied bone gravity, we have a, a term that looks like this. So the dilaton enters uh, inside the integral and multiplies um, what looks like an Einstein-Hilbert time type term and cosmological constant. And then there's some boundary terms here. This is the Gibbons-Hawking-York term, and this is just like a cosmological constant counter term. 
So this, um, I mean, sometimes this is just called the Jukib Tidal action, the second piece here, but. Okay, uh, why, how this plus and minus sign matters overall? Which signs? This, uh, the signs outside the third brackets. Uh, this, this sign here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is just because I'm writing the Euclidean action, so ah, I need okay. both overall minus sign. Yeah, so this is the Euclidean action. Um, good. Um, so, so we're going to call this the Jakeev Teitelboim uh, action or Jakeev Teitelboim gravity, and you add to it some uh, con some two-dimensional conformal field theory. And it only depends on the metric G. It does not depend on the dilaton phi. So in particular, the fields of the conformal field theory are not coupled to the dilaton, and they're minimally coupled to the metric. So that's the usual coupling of fields in a curved space time. OK? Good. So that's, that's the theory that we're considering. And it has as a solution ADS2. So there it is. ADS2 is this uh, infinite strip. Unlike ADS in higher dimensions, the Lorentzian manifold has two disconnected boundaries. You know, in higher dimensions, they're connected through the transverse sphere. Like in ADS3, you'd have an S1 that connects these into a circle. But in two dimensions, the transverse sphere is an S0. That's just two points. So you have these two, these two boundaries. So you have JT gravity plus CFT in here. OK. Um, that's not the full model. Uh, what they did is they added these flat space regions where you have the conformal field theory, but you do not have a gravitational theory. So in particular, they put transparent boundary conditions for the matter fields of the conformal field theory at this boundary. So if you have null matter that comes in, usually in ads we would kind of reflect it back in. But now we allow the null matter to go out into this flat space region where gravity is shut off. Um, saying gravity is shut off sounds a little bit weird. We learned that you can't really screen gravity. It couples to everything. It's universal, et cetera. The reason why it's uh, a reasonable thing to do here is the boundary conditions we choose uh, have the dilaton going to plus infinity at the ADS2 boundary. And in these one plus one dimensional dilaton gravity models, uh, the dilaton is controlling the strength of the gravitational coupling. The basic reason you could understand that is because it's multiplying the Ricci scalar. And you know, similarly, usually when we write down einstein hilbert type actions, one of Regine Newton is multiplying the Ricci scalar. So that's controlling the coupling. In particular, uh, phi going to infinity is like G noon going to zero. So the gravitational coupling is getting weak as we approach the boundary. So it's sort of a continuous thing. We get we go all the way here, the gravitational coupling is getting weak, weak, weak. It's kind of sort of hits zero right at the ADS2 boundary, and then we keep it zero out here. So it's um it's a more sort of reasonable thing to do. It still feels a little bit baroque, and I'll come later when we talk about models in flat space. Uh, the reason was to kind of move away from this sort of situation, which feels a little uncomfortable. But uh, it seems like a well-defined model. It's an interesting model. Putting these regions was first proposed in the context of the information paradox by uh, Jorge Roca in a paper around 10 years ago. And then um, Anna Sofman and Krutov considered it in the context of ADS2 for questions not directly related to the information paradox, but somewhat motivated by it. And then, of course, these papers from early last year um, uh, considered a similar model. It was very explicitly considered by really the second paper by Omhara, Engelhardt, Malf, and Maxwell. OK, and in the pictures in the first part of the talk, blue regions will refer to regions where I have a fluctuating gravity, and white regions will refer to regions where I don't have gravity. OK, that's what, why the colors are here. Any questions about the about the model? So, uh, just I have a question that uh, this phi naught is the value at the boundary. Is it so or bulk? Uh, so phi phi naught's just a constant value. It's um, yeah, phi naught's some constant. Oh, okay. it, it, yeah, it can take so the full dilaton we often think of as being phi naught plus uh, this phi. This phi is dynamical; it's not a constant. And then that full dilaton will take some value at the boundary, which is equal to phi naught plus whatever this phi is at the boundary, okay. which is sometimes called phi r or phi renormalized or something like that. OK. Um, well, this thing diverges at the boundary, but often we strip off a piece of the divergence and we call the rest phi r. 
Um, I should maybe say a few words about how this is uh, connected to the higher dimensional. Yeah, yeah, that that is very important. Yeah, can, picture. Can, yeah. yeah. Um, so the re well, okay. There are two ways you can think about these one plus one dimensional dilaton gravity models, for which JT gravity is one such model. Uh, one way you can think about it directly is as a two-dimensional theory of quantum gravity. You forget about any connection to higher dimensions, and you study this model uh, on its own. So this is something that was, for example, done by a paper uh, uh, in a paper by Harlow and Jaffris recently, where they canonically quantized uh, this theory. Okay, so you forget about any connection to higher dimensions. Um, now that model is uh, is a little strange. We don't. It's not holographic. Um, it has various uh, weirdnesses. It doesn't obey the Bekenstein-Hawking law for the entropy of the black holes, uh, but it's a totally, you know, well-defined uh, quantum gravity model. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another way you could think about it, which is uh, this model is a sort of low-energy approximation to some more full UV-complete model that obeys the Bekenstein-Hawking law and has all the features of the quantum theory of gravity we would like, and the way uh, you make that connection is that you can get this action that I've written here, this JT gravity action, by sort of dimensionally reducing a higher dimensional theory of gravity, let's say 4D uh, Einstein gravity in ADS. Um, by doing a dimensional reduction, uh, you know, in the background of, let's say, near extremal black holes. So if you do a dimensional reduction in the background of near extremal black holes, you can argue, you can mostly argue that the relevant terms are the ones I've kept here. And then in that context, this phi naught is actually related to the extremal entropy of the, of the black hole. And this part is related to the sort of first deviation from that extremal entropy. So it's related to the near extremal part um, of that black hole. That's one way to connect this to higher dimensional model of black holes. Another way is to directly think about ADS3 gravity, not consider any extremal black holes or anything like that. It's just a fact and it's a fun exercise to check if you take ADS3 um, gravity, so pure Einstein gravity in a negative cosmological constant, and you assume uh, spherical symmetry, and we're in ADS3, so the sphere is just a circle, it's an S1, you assume uh, symmetry along the S1, and you dimensionally reduce that action, uh, you'll get directly the thing that I wrote here, where this phi refers to the size of the transverse circle. Okay, so. That's another way to think about this diloton. In 2D, it's capturing the strength of the gravitational coupling. And in a dimensional reduction picture, it's also related to the size of the transverse sphere, both in the reduction from 4D and, and the reduction from 3D that I was talking about. So that's sort of some of the physics of what the, what's going yeah, on. Now it's clear to me. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, okay. So one thing I'll say, um, is, you know, in a lot of the, the work that's been done, well, not a lot, but in some of the work that's been done recently in this model, the perspective that's been taken is a sort of quantization of the model from the point of view of the Euclidean path integral. And when that's been done, the sort of very first step, uh, when uh, one of the very first steps people do is that you choose a contour for the dilaton, and the contour is chosen over the entire imaginary axis. And you do the path integral over that imaginary axis for the diloton. And the reason you do that is because if you look at this piece of the action, if I integrate phi over the imaginary axis, this looks like a Fourier integral. It looks like integrating, you know, if I'm doing e to the minus i, that path integral looks like an integral e to the i kx uh, over k, let's say. And we know that that picks a delta function, delta of x. So in particular, it enforces the constraint that r equals minus two. If I do the path integral over all imaginary phi, then I fix my path integral completely to r equals minus two, meaning even off shell, I only consider uh, locally ADS2 geometries. Okay, that's why the path integral is done that way. That's related to the solvability of the model and it's, I think, crucial um, to connecting this model to uh, you know, random matrix ensemble, which is some work maybe some people not answer familiar with. So it's an interesting question to, to wonder about that, that, that contour integral. Again, from the one plus one dimensional perspective, it's a totally well-defined thing to do. But if you want some more physical connection to a higher dimensional model, it's, it's not clear that that's what you would want to do. As I said, phi is like the size of the transverse sphere. 
And the way you could think about the contour over the imaginary axis is you start off with a contour over the full real axis and then you wick rotate it to the imaginary axis. But if you have a contour over the full real axis, in particular, you're integrating over negative five, which in the higher dimensional picture would mean you're integrating over negative metrics, which uh, is not something we really ever do in the sort of controlled one plus one models <clears throat> where we can do the path integral over geometry, like in the string world sheet, we integrate over positive definite metrics. So if you wanted to maintain some connection to a higher dimensional picture, you might worry about doing the integral that way. Uh, in this talk, that's not really going to play a role. I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, a saddle point analysis. I'm not really going to be talking about the full path integral and any random matrix interpretation. I'm just going to be talking about saddle points of this theory. So I don't need to commit myself to some contour for phi. Now, of course, whether the, the particular saddle contributes is related to the choice of contour, but I'm just going to assume that whatever the saddle is, it includes the saddle points. Sorry, whatever the contour is, uh, it ends up being valid to include the saddle points I'm talking about. Okay, that's a bit of a tangent, but I, I think it's important to keep in mind, um, given the things people have been looking at. Okay. Um, this topological term here, like I said, that this piece just evaluates to the Euler uh, character. It's not really going to play too much of a role in what I talk about. The only thing to keep in mind is that it leads to suppression of higher genus saddles. Okay, and this is basically its, its role in life uh, in this theory because the Euler character uh, decreases as the genus increases. All right, that's a quick introduction to the model and some salient features. Any questions before we talk about what state we're gonna be considering in this model? Since I have two hours, I'm gonna pause a lot for questions. All right, let's talk about the state. Uh, the state is really the thermal field double state. So here, I guess I didn't mention, I drew these little horizons and you should really think of these as like um, black hole horizons. That's the physics it's, it's capturing. So what state do we wanna put this uh, pair of black holes in? Well, we wanna put in the thermal field double state. In other words, we wanna put it at finite temperature. How do we do that? Well, there are two ways you can think of the Euclidean manifold. This is maybe the um, picture that people are, are more used to. Remember the white is like the flat space region. And we know how to put flat space at finite temperature. Here we have R2 and finite temperature is just putting it on the cylinder S1 cross R where the S1 is the thermal circle. So there's a the thermal circle. And if we had pure infinite flat space, it would just be the infinite cylinder S1 cross R. But we wanna glue um, this flat space to the ADS2 region. So we actually cut off the cylinder at some point and we glue in Euclidean ADS2. Okay, I'm, trying, I'm writing down the Euclidean manifold that's gonna prepare the thermal field double state. So we glue in Euclidean ADS2, and that's just the hyperbolic disk, uh, which can be drawn this way, okay? And the state at, let's say, t equals zero, cutting across this entire um, Cauchy slice here, um, is this red dotted line here. So I do the path integral on the lower half of the cylinder up to this t equals zero line, and that prepares for me the thermal field double state, which then I could evolve forward or backward in time. Another way to represent it, just by doing the sort of um, you know, plane to cylinder map, the exponential map, uh, is on the plane this way. So now I have Euclidean ADS2 here. Again, it's a hyperbolic disk out to radius one in some coordinates. And then outside of that, I have flat space. So here are the two sides of the thermal field double. Here's the right side, here's the left side. And I have the gluing of the ADS2 region to the flat region. I do the path integral on the lower half of this plane, and that prepares for me the thermal field double state at t equals zero, okay? All right, now that I have the state, I can evolve upward or downward um, from the t equals zero slice, which, which cuts across here. And as these authors pointed out, you can phrase an information paradox in this context, which is related to old phrasings of the information paradox in a situation of a critically illuminated black hole. People in the 80s and 90s, um, more so in the 90s, consider situations where you have sort of an internal black hole, a black hole that's trying to evaporate, but you feed it with more stuff, so you maintain it at a certain mass, 
And even there, you can phrase an information paradox. So let's see how that looks in this context. So I've drawn here two different um, time slices. Here's a t equals zero slice. Uh, and let's say I want to measure the entropy on this region union the region on the right. Okay, so it's symmetric intervals, the region on the left and the region on the right. And then I want to compare it to the entropy at some later time, uh, where the region becomes this region on the left and this region on the right. Okay, let me say a few things about this computation. Um, first thing is people are probably might be familiar with the fact that in the thermal field double state, there's a time like filling vector that evolves you forward on the right and backward on the left. Okay, but that's the reason why I'm evolving both sides forward in time, because if I had evolved the left side backwards in time, according to the time translation killing vector, then nothing should happen because it's time translation variant. The entropy should remain constant. So that would be uninteresting. It would not really be possible to phrase an information paradox in that context. So here I'm going to evolve them both forward in time. And there's a simple way to see what the entropy um, is doing in that context. So because this is like a 2D CFT on a fixed background, you can actually compute exactly the entropies that I'm talking about. But it's a little bit easier to just draw some pictures and see what happens because it gives some useful intuition. So what I've drawn here are, um, you can think of them as Hawking modes, and they just represent the entanglement structure in the vacuum. So this blue mode here is entangled with its partner mode behind the horizon there. And this green mode here is entangled with its partner mode here. So you could think of them really as like in some bell pair with log two worth of entanglement, something like that. And now let's look at t equals zero. At t equals zero, this right green mode is captured by the, re by the right region and the left green mode is captured by the left region. So the entropy of the union of the regions uh, doesn't get a contribution from this green mode or from this pair of green modes. Similarly, the left blue mode is missed by the left um, region at t equals zero and it's missed by the right region at t equals zero. So you also don't get a contribution from the blue modes. Of course, this full space time is full of these modes, but this illustration will be sufficient to capture the point I want to make. Now, if we evolve to some later time t up here, you see that something funny happens. The left green mode continues to be captured by the left region, but it's now no longer captured by the later right region. So it actually contributes, let's say, log two worth of entanglement as I evolve in time. And similarly, the left blue mode continues to be missed by the left region, but now the right blue mode is captured by the later right region. So you get a contribution to the entanglement also from this pair. So as I evolve in time, actually the kind of Hawking style computation in this setup will be that the entropy sort of continues to increase uh, forever. The black hole never evaporates um, because it's sort of being fed at the same rate that it's trying to evaporate. Uh, so the entanglement we just kind of continues to increase forever. The analog of the page curve in this case, which means the entropy of radiation that would be consistent with unitarity, is that the curve follows Hawking's curve for um, early times, but then at some point uh, turns around and follows the thermodynamic entropy of the black holes. Here there is a pair of them. There's a black hole on the right and a black hole on the left. So you have two times the black hole entropy, so the page curve begins following uh, that. And in this case, I, I made the turnaround sharp, but again, it, in the full model, it should sort of be a smooth, a smooth um, but quick turnover into following the entropy of the black hole. So this uh, is the thing we want to compute in this model. And the information paradox in this context is the fact that Hawking's answer is sort of arbitrarily wrong. It goes all the way to infinity if you evolve to infinite time. And that's not consistent with, with unitarity. Um, if we assume the black hole has finite entropy. Okay, that's, that's the paradox. So any, I'll pause to see if there are any questions about it because, uh, you know, any resolution will not seem very interesting if the paradox is not clear. So uh, just to to ask that what happened at t equal to zero, why this is going a little bit flat? Oh, um, that's just, yeah. To see that you just have to do the exact computation. It's, um, you know, the answer is something like a log cosh or something like that. So 
It's like log cosh uh, T over beta. So after like a few thermal times, it's very close to linear. Um, but at early time, there's some correction. So you need to wait a few thermal times and then it becomes basically exactly linear, but at early times there's some correction. It, it has to do with the particular form of what the CFT entanglement entry looks like in this space time. There's like log, you know, like log, log cinch is the form of the 2D CFT entanglement entry at finite temperature. Uh, and that's basically the function that's giving this kind of behavior that becomes linear and then at early times has some correction. Okay. Okay, all right, that's the thing that, um, so we'd like to reproduce this curve, this page curve here. All right, so I'll give a kind of a brief review of how we often compute um, entanglement entropy in field theory before talking about how to compute it in gravity. So in field theory, we want to compute this quantity minus trace rho log rho. So S of R is the entropy of region R. So region R, for example, was this left region union, this right region. So let's say we want to compute the entropy of that region. We then we first want to compute the density matrix, the reduced density matrix uh, restricted to that region R, and then just compute the combination minus trace rho log rho for that reduced density matrix. Now, if we could compute that reduced density matrix, we'd be done. We'd take its log, multiply by rho, take the trace, take a minus sign, we'd have the entropy. But often we can't compute the density matrix exactly. Um, but what we can compute is uh, sort of powers of the density matrix or traces of powers of the density matrix. And traces of the powers of density matrix through what's called the replica trick can actually be related back to this quantity. So how does that work? Call, let's call trace rho to the n, z sub n. The reason I'm calling it z will become clear in a second. It's basically because of this picture. And then you can compute a quantity called the nth Rennie entropy, which is this combination of z sub n. If this is just a normalization. And then the original entropy, this thing that you want, uh, the, you can use a mathematical identity, which is given by this here, um, which basically lets you analytically continue this to n equals one. So we're doing something a little bit funny, which okay, we can talk about a little bit, but I, I, I won't which is we compute this quantity for positive integer n, and then we want to analytically continue that to n equals one. So in general, such a thing will not have a unique analytic continuation, but there are theorems in certain contexts which will tell you that it can be unique. Um, but here, uh, we're sort of going to be taking the, the naive continuation to n equals one. Okay, and it's just given by computing this. All this to say that the quantity we want to compute is zn. That, that's really what we want. And what is zn? It's, you know, by various kind of path integralology, uh, trace rho to the n is just the partition function In fact, of the theory. I have just one uh, doubt here. That yeah. If you take n tending to one in the Rena entropy, always we get back to the, the uh, von Neumann entropy. Is it always true? Um, well, so if you, right. So, okay, there's a question about um, about the analytic continuation. Yes. Like I said, it's 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 not really uh, unique if all you have is an ant if all you have is an answer at positive integer n. Um, but there, okay, there's a technical theorem called Carlson's theorem, which is a statement about what this density matrix looks like in in the complex plane. And if you assume that the the assumptions of that theorem are satisfied, then there's a unique analytic continuation. And that's basically, you should think about this continuation I'm doing as landing on that unique analytic continuation. And in particular, it will give me this combination, this minus trace rho log rho. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so the name of the game has become to compute this partition function z sub n. So that's why I called it z, because it's like a partition function. And uh, I've drawn it here for z2, if I have n equals two, um, what, what this manifold is, is you take one copy of your manifold and if n equals two, you make a, a copy of it. So you have two of them and then you glue them together along these cuts. These cuts are the region where I want to be computing the entropy. So you, you should think of them as like that region, union, that region. 
I mean, I'm in the Euclidean picture, so it's more like, you know, this left region meaning the right region. Um, so I glue them together along these cuts, meaning if I go through this cut and I'm on this top sheet, I come out on the bottom sheet down here. Similarly, if I go through, let's say, this cut on the bottom sheet, I come out on the top sheet up here. Okay. And just rewriting this equation here um, shows me how this is related to uh, the entropy. And in particular, if I have a large entropy, that means I have a small z sub n. Okay, that's going to be important in a moment. But in field theory, that's it. That's the full co computation we want to do. We want to compute the partition function of, let's say, our CFT on this topologically non-trivial manifold. And from that, we can extract the entropy. OK? Yeah, OK. All right, so how has this changed uh, in, in gravity? Um, it's not very different. So now I have the same cuts, and I've drawn z sub 2 again. But now we have some gravitational region, OK? And in gravity, we know that we can't, we have to be a little bit careful with the path integral. The way we do the path integral is we fix, we don't fix the geometry a priori. We fix some boundary conditions that define our gravitational problem, meaning we fix some conditions along this circle here and this circle here. And then we have to do the gravitational path integral to, to fill in this geometry. Okay, again, we're not, we're not allowed to fix it beforehand. Here, the geometry on this full manifold was fixed because we're doing field theory on a fixed space time. Now we're doing gravity, so we pick boundary conditions. And when we do the gravitational path integral, when I draw it this way, there are two simple things you can do, at least at the level of pictures. One of them is I can fill them in with independent hyperbolic disks. These are just two independent copies of Euclidean ADS2. And so this is a particular manifold which can contribute to Z2. But again, at the level of pictures, I can do something different. I can connect them up by a wormhole. Okay, there's a different manifold I can have. And this can also uh, contribute to Z2. And you know, the, we want to do a computation of general Z sub n. So here I've drawn the picture for n equals 6. You can have this fully connected wormhole. You know, the cuts are still drawn here. Um, this is a particular saddle you can have in the computation of this partition function. And at these higher ends, you can see that there's also sort of intermediate things you can do. You can connect up, let's say, these two sheets, um, connect up these three sheets, and then leave this one with just the Euclidean ADS2 and lots of other combinations. So there's a whole set of things you can possibly do. But the only, um, uh, the relevant ones for the page curve are really going to be this type of saddle point, the fully disconnected saddle, where you have independent hyperbolic disks, and the fully connected saddle, the analog of, of, of this guy at general n. And it's going to be a transition between these two saddle points that gives you uh, the transition in the curve that I drew from the hawking part of the curve um, to the page part of the curve. Okay, So you could think of this, in this sense, as like a phase transition, where you have a competition of saddles analogous to the Hawking page phase transition, ADS-CFT. And the transition happens when you go from this saddle to this saddle. And good. OK, so I'm not going to talk about the details of that transition. I'll just point out that two of the important things to, to think about um, are, one, uh, this is a topologically non-trivial manifold. It's, it's a higher genus than, than this one. Um, so you can wonder, why does this ever dominate? Uh, I said earlier that there's this topological term in the JT action, which suppresses manifolds of higher genius. Okay? And that's true. That's there. But that's some sort of like fixed uh, finite suppression, um, if, if finite is finite. That's some fixed finite suppression. And that's why at time t equals 0, for example, we're not in this saddle, because it's suppressed. According to the genius, we're in this saddle. But I said another thing when I was reviewing the replica trick in field theory, which is that if you have a large entropy, this implies a small z sub n. So in field theory, this doesn't really mean that much. But in gravity, where I have a saddle point approximation to computing the partition function, remember we saw that the Hawking curve, the Hawking part of the curve, leads to an increasing entropy. And that's when you're in this type of saddle point. So as the entropy is getting very, very large, the contribution of this saddle is getting small. So in time, the country saddle is getting small. So even if this one was suppressed at some point in time, at some later point in time, 
it can become unsuppressed relative to this one and dominate. And, and that's in fact exactly what happens. The buildup of entanglement is exactly what leads to the transition between this type of saddle and this type of saddle. Okay. So the information paradox, you could have phrased even at the level of Rennie entropies. Um, so these pictures in that case would sort of be, be sufficient to say, okay, there's a transition, you get a sort of unitary page curve, but historically it was phrased at the level of entanglement entropies. So to connect back to that, we want to do this analytic continuation to n equals one that I talked about, because this, you know, these here I'm computing Rennie's, not the entanglement entropy. And the sort of uh, punchline of the replica wormhole papers from last year is that if I do that analytic continuation to n equals one, I reproduce um, what, what's sometimes called the island, or what's almost always called the island rule. And the island rule is the following equation. <clears throat> it's basically a souped up Ryu Takenagi type formula. It says that if you want to compute the entropy of some region R in a theory of quantum gravity, so here we think of this as a theory of quantum gravity, and region R is in some non gravitational region, just so we, we know what we're talking about. If you want to compute that entropy, you have to do this funny procedure. The funny procedure says um, you consider the inclusion of what are called island regions I. So here I've drawn a particular island region. And then you extremize the generalized entropy um, with the inclusion of that island region. Okay, what's the generalized entropy? It's like a gravitational entropy plus uh, a quantum field theory entropy. Here's the gravitational entropy. Okay, it's the area of the boundary of the island. So it's the, these two points here. Um, in, in general dimensions, this is just the A over 4G term, it's the beckinson hawking term in Einstein gravity that we're used to. In 1 plus 1 dimensions, there's no area to this term. Um, but the thing that takes its place is the value of the dilaton. Okay, so the value of the dilaton here and here. You can derive that directly from like 1 plus 1 dimensional considerations, but you can also see that it's reasonable from a higher dimensional perspective because the dilaton, as I said, captured the size of the transverse sphere. Um, and the area of the, the transverse sphere would have given you the entropy in higher dimensions. So it's a totally reasonable thing that the dilaton enters into the entropy. So in one plus one, you could think of this as phi over four. I've said genu to one. You could think of this as phi over four instead of area over four. And then there's a quantum field theory entropy piece, which is just the ordinary entropy of fields on a fixed background. Um, but it's you also include the region I. So it's R is, let's say, this region in that region plus this island region I. Okay, so you construct this quantity upon including some island region I, and then you want to extremize over I, okay? You want to extremize over the inclusion of this island region I, and if there are multiple extrema, you want to minimize over uh, all those extrema. Okay, that's, that's the procedure. It's, uh, it's basically a fancy sort of Ryu Takenagi, but it, here we're not really assuming holography and this kind of perspective on the Ryu Takenagi formula goes back to sort of the original derivation by Lipwitz and Maldesena. There also, there was no real assumption of, of holography in, in its derivation. So this is what the island rule tells you. And you can see um, quickly from this rule um, how the page curve can, can be obtained. So without the rule, we just had this problem where we go forward in time and the entropy is just kind of increasing forever. So this picture is supposed to represent this Hawking style curve. But now what happens is at time t equals zero, um, if you apply this rule, you'll find that uh, there's no island that you should include. Okay, the minimum is given by including no island at all. So the curve at early times is exactly like the curve you would have had in this case. Okay, so that's the first half of the page curve. And then you'll see that at some finite time, it'll actually be beneficial to include an island, meaning including an island will minimize this combination and will give you a lower entropy than not including the island, meaning you'll land on this part of the curve. And the way we see that is with these green and blue modes again. So without an island, we saw that the left green mode was captured by the later left region and missed by the later right region. So it contributed to the entropy. But now that green mode is captured by the island region. So it actually doesn't contribute to the entropy because we have in the island formula 
the QFT entropy of R union I. So it's captured by the I lambda in R. And similarly with the blue modes, we saw that later in time, the right blue mode was now captured by the later right region, and the left blue mode was missed by the left region. Now also it's captured by the I lambda. Another way of saying it is, as we evolve in time, we build up a lot of entanglement in the, with the interior and the exterior. And that is what leads to this increase in the Hawking uh, entropy. And the way we can sort of reduce that entanglement is just by including in our computation um, a region that captures the interior of the black hole. Then all that buildup of entanglement will, will go away. And again, you can compute this directly using 2D CFT techniques, but the picture is sort of sufficient to, to see physically what's, what's going on. And the transition as I evolve in time between not having an island and having an island is exactly this transition I was talking about here, I'm going from this fully disconnected saddle to the fully connected saddle. So in the continuation of n equals one, you could think of it just in terms of this island rule and transitions in, you know, from not having an island to having an island. All right, I think that was a lot of uh, ideas at once. So I'll pause for a minute and see if there are any, any questions. This, this is really all I was going to say about the, um, the work from last year, in particular, reproducing the page curve from the perspective of replicable wormholes. That, I don't remember if I said that name before, but that's what we called these things. Uh, they're wormholes in replica space, so we call them replica wormholes. Yeah, you can proceed, I think. Sorry? Um, yeah. Hello. In the curve in red, uh, in the page uh, curve, uh, do you have like a formula to describe this curve for entropy as a function of time? Like a function or something that describes this curve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can compute this in various models. Okay. So, I mean, here, okay, here, well, Okay, good. So let, let me let me say a few things about about this this curve. So in the approximation, where I only consider the fully disconnected saddle and the fully connected saddle, um, then I can tell you, and that's an approximation. But in that approximation, I can tell you um, what this function is. Uh, at early times, like I said, it's it follows the Hawking curve, and the Hawking curve, the entropy is given by a single interval entanglement entropy at finite temperature. In, CF, in 2D CFT, and that's like this log cinch formula. So this is like some log cinch. Mm -hmm. um, and at later times, when I include the island, uh, well, the functional part there is given, it's just two times the black hole entropy. And the black hole entropy is like phi naught plus phi all divided by 4G. So transition transitions from something like the log uh, cinch to um, this pure constant. Okay. Now, that is in the limit where I approximated uh, the full path angle just by these saddle points. And you can ask, um, you know, finite end, like I was saying, there are other saddle points. There are ones that connect a few of these sheets, don't connect any of them. There's a whole host of saddle points. Uh, what happens if I include those? And in a, in a simple toy model, um, this question was answered um, by uh, this paper by um, Pennington, Stanford, Schenker, and Yang. Um, and in that, in that toy model, you can basically do the path integral exactly. And you see that what all those other saddle points are giving you is just a smoothening out of this. So here it's sharp because we just had a sharp transition. But if you include all the other saddle points, this sharp point actually kind of gets lightly smoothened out into a crossover. Um, and so the function is not exactly this one that I'm saying. It's not so simple as log cinch plus this constant. Uh, it just gets smoothened out by a little bit. Okay, and is there any uh, characteristic time um, that characterizes the passage from the, this transient regime to the, let's say, stationary regime where you have an entropy constant through time? Do you have like a this time characteristic here. time? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's what's called the page time. And that by, um, by sort of general principles from before, and it's shown explicitly in these models here, <coughs> excuse me, um, occurs when the entropy of the radiation equals the entropy of the black hole, or equals two times the entropy of the black hole. So you could compute that and it'll spit out for you some, um, some time. I mean, in an actual evaporating black hole, I'll have an example in a little bit that shows you explicitly what that time is.
But generally, you just want to equate those two things and then solve for the time. There's a simple algebraic equation that'll tell you what time the crossover happens. And there's a good reason for that, by the way. The good reason is, you know, you can't entangle yourself uh, too much with a finite quantum system. So if we really believe that the black hole, the pair of black holes we have here is a finite quantum system, has a Hilbert space of e to the 2s black hole worth of states, then we can't arbitrarily entangle ourselves with it, right? It's some finite Hilbert space. You can put it in some maximally mixed state, and it can't really be more entangled than that. So to be consistent with that um, picture, that means that once the entanglement of uh, the radiation is about to increase past that point, uh, something had better put a stop to it because it would be inconsistent with unitarity. So the transition happens at basically the latest possible time it can, but it's consistent with unitarity. And that has to be when the two entropies are equal because we believe the black hole is a finite quantum system. Okay. If you don't believe the finite quantum, that the black hole is a finite quantum system and there's some toy models of quantum gravity where it's not, then there's nothing wrong with this curve. You just draw this curve, you say that the black hole can host an infinite number of states and that's just the correct answer. And I'll, actually in the very next example, we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so I said that this model felt a, a little baroque because it glues this ADS2 region to a flat space region. Um, we didn't use holography here, we just used the gravitational path integral. But one might worry is really, maybe there's really holography going on. Otherwise, why did you consider ADS2 space time? Um, so motivated by that, we wanted to look at some pure flat space models. So it's still gonna be a one plus one dimensions. The basic reason all this stuff is done in one plus one dimensions is because it's easiest to compute entanglement entropies in quantum field theory one plus one dimensions. In higher dimensions, there are very few exact formulas we have in such a situation. So one plus one gives us those formulas. And also in one plus one dimensions, the therm, you know, in 2D CFT, the thermal state is conformally related to zero temp state. And that morally is also helpful in, in, in what's going on. So we're gonna still stay in one plus one dimensions, but we're gonna consider a theory of gravity that is asymptotically flat. Okay, it's called the CGHS model or the RST model. It's actually quite a beautiful model. So I have a few slides going over some of the background of it in kind of more modern language because some of these older papers, uh, well, they're beautiful papers, but their, their language is maybe a little, a little outdated, let's say. Um, okay, so good. So we have this model. Here's the classical action. And it looks a little bit um, more complicated than the JT model, but we'll see in a second that it's, it's really not because it has this, you know, has this kinetic term for the diltan, the diltan appears exponentially here. And, and the only difference between the CGHS model and the RST model is the RST model has this additional term. Okay, and we'll come back to why this term was included in a second. And just like JT, you have a CFT action that's minimally coupled to the metric and not coupled to the diltan. This is always very important in the solvability of diltan gravity models. Okay, this theory is gonna have solutions where you can have um, non-trivial curvature. So in particular, there's a conformal anomaly, right? The trace of the stress tensor in 2D CFT is proportional to the central charge times the Ricci scalar. You can integrate that up into a term in the action that looks like this. And there's actually a large C limit you can take um, such that this is the full quantum effect of action, okay? Um, and that's very interesting because we'll see in a moment that that quantum effect of action will have black holes, it'll have Hawking radiation, it'll have everything you want in like a theory of quantum gravity and some stuff you, you don't want. Uh, but it has all that and it's actually exactly solvable, which is quite remarkable. So, uh, okay, I guess that's what I just said. The effect of action is exact at large C. And actually this full model with this RST term plus this anomaly term is equivalent to what's sometimes called flat space JT. This model looks a lot simpler. Here's the action. The CFT action just comes along for the ride. And the diltan gravity part looks like this. Um, in particular, the, this capital phi is different than this lowercase phi. All I've done is some field redefinitions that mix the metric and the diltan. 
to let me write it in this way, okay? Now to connect to these earlier examples, let's say we work in conformal gauge. It's almost always a good idea in one plus one dimensions because all manifolds are conformally flat. So I can write them with some conformal factor times a flat space metric. I've just done in null coordinates. This is just in Kossi space with plus conformal factor. Um, then in these variables, uh, the RST or CGHS action has two degrees of freedom. It has the dilaton. I'm, I'm ignoring the CFT degree of freedom. The gravitational part has the dilaton lowercase phi. And the metric degree of freedom has been reduced to this conformal mode rho. And it turns out that this full action plus the anomaly has a U1 current. And you can check this by ordinary another procedure. It has a U1 current given by this, meaning the derivative of this vanishes. And actually, I said that these two models are equivalent, so this model should have some U1 symmetry, and it's actually this shift symmetry in capital phi. Okay, might not look like a shift symmetry, but we need to remember in one plus one dimensions, the uh, Ricci scalar is like a total derivative. It's like a topological term. So if I shift phi by a constant, then I'm left with a total derivative, and so there's a local current associated to that. And now we can see why RST added this term. If we didn't have this term, then this classical action would have a U1 current, uh, but the conformal anomaly would break it, okay? So the U1 current would not survive in the quantum theory. The reason RST added this term is because this full quantum effective action then will have a U1 current. This sort of cancels the effect of the breaking of the U1 current due to this term, and this full quantum effective action then has this U1 symmetry. They weren't really trying to connect directly to this action, but just for analytic solubility, uh, this U1 current is very useful. So then they were able to do various things that had only been done in CGHS models numerically. They could then do it analytically because of this U1 current. The physics agreed. The numerics people had done in CGHS versus the eventual analytics in RST. The physics was all the same. Um, it was just nice because then you had analytic formulas. Yeah, I'm not really going to talk about the model in this presentation, but it's, it's useful to remember because I don't know, this sometimes looks a little messy. All right. Um, so there's, you know, this conformal gauge doesn't fully fix the gauge freedom of the model. So you can do further gauge fixing and then do some field redefinitions. And actually you can reduce all the degrees of freedom to a single degree of freedom, some scalar field, which we can call omega. And the full um, equations, the equations of the full quantum effective action are these. Okay, and you can tell these are quite simple looking equations. In fact, you can just integrate them up and get the general solution for a general stress tensor. I'll talk in a moment about what T flat is. It's basically a stress tensor ignoring the vial anomaly, but I'll write an equation in a moment that hopefully makes that clear. And here, I've said that we want to restrict to this capital omega greater than or equal to one quarter. This particular one quarter is convention dependent. It's just there's some number there. Um, and the reason we do that is related to what I was talking about before uh, with JT gravity and ADS2. This capital omega is related to the size of the transverse sphere in higher dimensions if you want to connect the CJHS RST model to a higher dimensional theory of gravity. So we don't actually want to consider, you know, geometries where the transverse sphere is negative size. We don't really even know what that means. So this restriction corresponds to, in the higher dimensional picture, um, only having positive definite metrics, okay? So this is a difference in how these kind of older models had been studied versus how current, you know, in the kind of more modern literature, people have been trying to define the JT model, for example, by considering all possible plots. But we'll stick to this picture of restricting to that range. Okay, we can write some solutions for the model. The first one is called the linear dilaton vacuum. Okay, this doesn't look linear, but it's because it's in terms of field omega. If I'd written the solution in terms of the original dilaton phi, it would be linear. Okay, so it's some expression that looks like this is quite simple. You can sort of check in real time that these equations are satisfied. What does the metric look like? If I go back to kind of more physical degrees of freedom, the metric is just flat in sigma coordinates, and it's also flat in these coordinates, but it takes this funny form. The stress tensor is zero. That's why it's the vacuum. We put the matter fields in their vacuum, meaning zero stress energy tensor. And we solve 
for the metric in the deltaon, and this is what we find. And here is, uh, you know, sort of what I meant by T flat. This is just the compact wave writing this equation. You have the full stress tensor in X coordinates, say this one, um, and it's related to uh, what's called T flat by the anomaly, right? So the stress tensor in this metric, we know how to get it by just doing um, a vowel transformation to the flat space metric. And we know how the stress tensor transforms into vowel transformations by this combination. So T flat just means ignore that combination. You could have written the equation here in terms of the real, the physical T. And then we just have these anomaly terms on the right hand side, but this is just convent often how it's written in the literature. Okay, here's the Penrose diagram. So this full thing is 2D Minkowski space, which people are probably used to. Minkowski space usually is just half of it, but remember in one plus one, we can kind of open up the Penrose diagram. This is again, the statement that the transverse sphere is an S zero in one plus one dimension. So it's like two points. And we have this cutoff that I was talking about, omega equals one quarter. Okay, so we want to cut off our space time here. This kind of looks like um, what one might interpret as a naked time-like singularity because we just cut off space-time here. But remember, again, in the connection to higher dimensions, this is a place where the transverse sphere shrinks to zero size. So the way to think about that is like the origin of radial coordinates, right? In higher dimensions, the sphere, transverse sphere also shrinks to zero size at the origin of radial coordinates, but it's not a singular point. If you had an S wave come into that origin, it would just kind of reflect back out and, and go out. So with that intuition in mind, the way this model is considered is um, in the 2D picture, you just put reflecting boundary conditions here. So if you have something that goes and hits this time like boundary, it kind of reflects back in, and that's mirroring this S wave. So if the S wave kind of collapses spherically symmetrically, it's just going to go back up. All right, that's the vacuum of the theory. Now, this theory is not impressive because it can produce a vacuum solution. Almost any theory uh, can do that for you. It's impressive because it can produce an evaporating black hole solution. So what does evaporating black hole look like? We can send in a shock wave on the vacuum. So this part of omega, if you remember, is actually just the, the vacuum piece. So we start off with vacuum, and then we add to it a shock wave. Well, here's a stress tensor for the shock wave, some delta function at some time x plus equals uh, one, so sometime here. The usual Penrose diagram looks like the things we draw in higher dimensions. The shockwave goes in, creates a black hole, black hole evaporates, you're left in Minkowski space again. Um, but if I draw it in the sort of coordinates I was using before, so this is not a Penrose diagram, we have the omega equals one quarter um, uh, point, which is time-like. Uh, and in the vacuum, this would have just kind of continued time-like along its merry way. But now the shockwave comes in and collides with that omega equals one quarter point and actually turns it around and makes it space-like. And this is interpreted as the black hole singularity. You know, when it's space like, it doesn't make sense that you put reflecting boundary conditions. Um, so this is interpreted as a black hole singularity and you could compute curvatures and things and see that that is true, that the curvatures are singular here. And then at some later point in time, it turns around and becomes time-like again. And when it becomes time-like, um, that's interpreted as the endpoint of the black hole evaporation because it's sort of back to being in like the vacuum this thing's time like again. Okay, so this is what Omega looks like. That's the stress tensor. And remarkably, you could compute the stress tensor an observer at Scribe Plus would see in, in this model. So to do that, we want to compute the metric out at infinity. The metric is flat in these sigma coordinates, uh, where I put a sigma tilde on the um, minus direction. And that's just because uh, the sigmas are related by exponentials to the x coordinates, as you can see from this metric here. Um, but the x minus direction just has this shift. This shift by m, m is related to the strength of the shock wave, which of course is related to the mass of the resulting black hole. So you just need this shift and the metric is flat in these coordinates sigma plus and sigma tilde minus. What that means is I wanna compute the stress tensor in these coordinates, because that's what this is what an asymptotically inertial observer at Scribe Plus would see. And that stress tensor has a very simple expression. It looks like this, okay? And this expression is simple, but it's quite, it's quite remarkable because it shows you, so sigma tilde minus, you could think it's, it's time along Scribe Plus. So minus infinity is down here. 
And 4m is uh, this evaporation endpoint here. That's, you know, let's say this null time here. So minus infinity, the stress tensor is zero, right? If we plug in sigma tilde minus is minus infinity. This piece is zero. You get one minus one is zero. Stress tensor is zero. The observer sees no radiation. But then immediately the radiation starts ramping up as soon as it's not minus infinity. It starts ramping up and it pretty quickly reaches uh, a roughly constant one quarter. Okay, and that's really the black hole forming, sort of slowly beginning to Hawking radiate and then hitting some kind of constant Hawking radiation production. And that's this constant stress energy tensor. It's this one quarter until the evaporation endpoint um, where, uh, well, it's a little confusing, but at the evaporation endpoint, what's done is somewhat of a phenomenological model. I'm not really going to talk about times past the evaporation endpoint, so it's kind of irrelevant. But one of the drawbacks of the model is you have to glue in the vacuum um, at the evaporation endpoint, because otherwise this model has a weird feature that it actually kind of continuously radiates and the black hole goes to negative infinite mass. So that's this weird feature. It has a phenomenological fix. It's not really going to be important for what I'm talking about, because I'm going to talk about times before the evaporation endpoint. And there, this formula beautifully shows the production of Hawking radiation due to the formation of the black hole. I keep saying beautiful and remarkable. It's because it's, uh, this is old work. This is work from the 90s. There are great papers from then computing these, these sorts of things. Any questions about that solution? Okay, so we can now try and compute the entropy of radiation in this model. And that's in fact what these authors, Viola, Prescott, Stronger, and Trivedi did in what is yet again, another beautiful paper on this model. And the way the model is defined, the entropy in quantum, so if you were to canonically quantize this model, the entropy in quantum gravity is just the ordinary QFD entropy in, um, of the region R. So the QFD entropy means, you know, just the entropy of quantum fields on a fixed semi-plasma space-time. And that thing we know how to calculate. There's just some 2D CFT formulas for that. It's given by this, up to some UV and IR divergent junk. The UV divergent junk is the usual UV divergent junk in entanglement entropy, um, which in a full theory of quantum gravity we expect to be cured. And the IR divergent junk is actually a little bit different from the ADS case because there are really you know, ADS is kind of like a, it gives you kind of an IR cutoff in here in plasmas. We don't have that. We have a huge thermal bath we need to worry about. So there's some additional divergences. But the physical part we care about is this. And this again has that structure that after some time, sigma tilde minus, oh, it's just for observer. After some time, this qu pretty quickly becomes linear because this becomes large. So it's log exponential, which is linear. So pretty quickly, the entropy becomes linear in time and you get the Hawking curve. And that's actually the right answer. If you canonically quantize this model, that's the answer you get, that the uh, entropy just increases linearly in time forever. And the way that's interpreted is that the theory has remnants. What that means is that the entropy of the black hole is not given by A over 4G. Uh, it can actually be infinitely large. So as the entropy, as the black hole is kind of evaporating, even when it gets really, really, really small, uh, it can host an arbitrarily large number of states. Okay, so that is consistent with unitarity. So it's not the Hawking information paradox in the usual sense, but this was always one of the outs in the history of the information paradox. One of the things you could have always said is, oh, the, it's unitary, the theory just has remnants. So practically all the information is kind of stored in some tiny Planck-sized ball with a bajillion states, and that's just what happens. Um, and in this model, that's actually the correct answer. Any, any questions? It's a subtle point, this distinction between remnants and information loss. So if there are questions, please ask. Okay. Um, but I was careful to say that this is the right answer in this model as defined by, let's say, canonical quantization. But you can ask, what if we don't want to define the model by canonical quantization? You know, quantization defines the model in a fixed topology. In particular, it, there's no room for anything like replica wormholes, which are these, you know, these Euclidean topologies. Um, so you can say, well, let's try and modify the model. Let's actually include a sum over Euclidean topologies and take more, instead of the canonical quantization perspective, 
the Euclidean quantization perspective, where we actually sum over all Euclidean topologies. And if you do that, then you should get that the quantum gravity entropy of region R is given by the island form. Okay, and in this paper, um, we provide some evidence for, for why this formula should come out. We don't fully construct the replicable wormholes, et cetera, uh, but we do a local analysis that shows you that you should extremize this quantity um, if you sum over topologies. Now, if we have this formula, now we want to revisit the computation and compute the entropy of radiation. But again, it's hard to define regions in quantum gravity because the metric is fluctuating, everything's fluctuating. Um, but in this case, we have scribe plus, we have null infinity um, where gravity is getting weak. So we can define regions out there and we don't really have to worry about gravitational back reaction or anything like that. Um, that's sort of a choice that we make scribe plus non-dynamical. It's effectively like the flat space region in the earlier setups, okay? I can say more about that at the end if people are interested in it, but I don't wanna dwell on it. And now we can revisit the example and see what this formula would give us for the entropy of radiation. And uh, these authors considered uh, very similar questions in this model. I'm not gonna go through the computation, but there are no surprises. If I work um, in large mass black holes and work at like uh, slightly later times, then the island formula uh, gives me this. So here, uh, you know, earlier someone was asking if there's a particular uh, function so for this evaporating black hole, here it is, there's the function. Here's the UV and IR divergent junk I was talking about. The UV divergence is this epsilon UV. Sigma O plus is the time of the observer. I mean, we're putting the observer at scribe plus, so that's infinite, so that's the IR divergent um, junk. And the function is very simple. It follows the Hawking curve for some time until it transitions into this one and goes back down to zero, okay? And the reason that happens is because this transition, at some point, uh, we include an island region in the interior. And once we include this island region, then the entropy begins to decrease. The page time, as I said, is, um, should be when the entropy of radiation equals the entropy of the black hole. And that's at a third of the way um, through the evaporation time. That's 4m over 3. Often it's said that this page time is at the halfway point. That's not quite correct. The reason it's not quite correct is because the entropy production in black hole evaporation is not um, isentropic. It's not adiabatic. You produce entropy. The black hole loses some amount of entropy. You gain two times that amount in the radiation. Uh, and so that uh, tells you immediately that the point where the entropy of radiation equals entropy of the black hole should be a third of the way. That's why the curve looks like this. Any questions about this model. It's the last thing I'm going to say about the CGHS model. Okay. Um, if good, if you uh, were either lost or didn't care particularly about CGHS or RST, I'm going to switch topics now. Uh, still going to be about islands and um, entropies and things like that, but it's a little bit more general now. We're we'll talking about this paper with Tom Hartman and Yukun Jiang, where um, we were curious. You know, if we wanted to really have a more systematic way of searching for islands or computing entropies in general dimensions in general space times, like how do we do that? I mentioned earlier, it's hard to compute QFT entanglement in general dimensions and, and in general space time. So is there, what, 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 what can we do to extend this to higher dimensions? We're also motivated by the question of cosmology, how to understand whether islands can appear in cosmology. And one of the difficulties in using the island rule is that you have to compute these entropies that I'd written of uh, I union R. So they're entanglement entropies of like uh, two disjoint regions. And those formulas in particular are difficult. So it'd be nice without going through the island formula, if one could check, if I handed you a space time, can you check, can this space time host an island, right? Um, it seems like you shouldn't be able to answer the question because whether or not an island exists depends on the region R uh, that you pick. Uh, but there are actually some quantum information tools you can use to strip away the region R 
and just at the level of the space-time itself, analyze whether or not it can host an island. Okay, this is very useful because otherwise, if you start analyzing a space-time and start searching for an island, you can always question how clever you were. You can always say, and I spent a fair amount of time doing this, oh, what if I had actually considered this region over here or this region in some disconnected universe, maybe that region will have an island in the space-time. You can always, you know, there's always the what if. But there are actually some conditions, some necessary conditions you could derive independent of region R that uh, will allow you to analyze this question. So here I'll talk about two of them. This looks messy, but it's actually rather straightforward. What have I written here? This is just the extremality condition of the island formula. So the island formula was a generalized entropy of I union R, which was the QFT entropy of I union R plus the gravitational entropy of I. That thing needs to be extremized. That means that the derivative with respect to the island endpoint needs to vanish. This lambda plus is just a null outgoing derivative. It's a particular derivative. You didn't have to pick that one, but I just chose it because I can't. Um, this is just extremality condition. So if an island exists, this needs to be true, right? Okay, I can rewrite this condition. So I've expanded out the generalized entropies. So there's the QFT entropy of I union R that I said. And there's the area term. I just kind of split them into these two pieces. I've added and subtracted the QFT entropy of I. So that clearly doesn't change anything. And then I've also subtracted the QFT entropy of, of R. Now that's okay because the DD lambda plus is acting on this and it's going to annihilate this because lambda plus is a derivative with respect to the island endpoint. And this doesn't depend on the island region at all. So this derivative will kill this. So this is just a rewriting of the extremality condition. But now it's, um, you can see I've split it up into these two meaningful quantities. This is the generalized entropy of just region I. Okay, so you can see them sort of working toward extracting something just by region I. And this thing is the mutual information between I and R, or it's the negative of the mutual information between I and R. So another way I can rewrite this extremality condition is this way. The derivative of the generalized entropy equals the derivative of the mutual information. And now actually, uh, there's a powerful statement, which is called monot monotonicity of mutual information, which is the same as strong subadditivity, or it's derived from strong subadditivity, which says that this derivative needs to be positive. Why does it need to be positive? I said this is a null outgoing derivative. In particular, it increases the region of size i. So you know more by doing that. So the mutual information is positive under that change. Similarly, for the inward going null derivative, the region, uh, so, you know, size i, uh, yeah, region I decreases in size, so that derivative needs to be negative. Okay, mutual information should decrease if you decrease the size of the region. And now I can forget about this mutual information. These are inequalities just on the generalized entropy of I. It's given by this. But one way to say this to connect to some language in the literature is that uh, the boundary of I needs to be in the quantum normal region. This is an analogy to what's called a classically normal region, which is um, this statement, but instead of S gen, we have the area. So whether, you know, a, like a classically trapped region is a region inside a black hole where outgoing and ingoing null rays actually all go inward, none of them make it out. Um, so quantum normal or quantum trap is all those same notions, but now instead of the area, it's the area plus the quantum field theory entropy. But, okay, that's just some language. This is, this is the inequality. This is a necessary condition for any island, and it doesn't refer to region R. So if you're curious, can you know my matter-dominated FRW cosmology host an island? Uh, you can check these conditions. Because they had better be true from extremality. Remember, there's also, if there are multiple extrema, you should then minimize. And um, in these island situations, there are always going to be multiple extrema because there's always the case of no island at all. Okay. So here I've done, I've basically written the minimization. This is the case with no island at all. The entropy of region R is just the ordinary QFT entropy. And the entropy with the island rule is the generalized entropy. It's A over 4 plus the QFT entropy of I union R. So if you want to include an island, this combination had better be smaller than this combination. Otherwise, it won't satisfy the minimization condition. And now I can rewrite this again. I add and subtract the QFT entropy of region I. 
and then I move some terms around to get this combination. And then I can use the Iraqi leave inequality. The Iraqi leave inequality is this. I can use it on the right hand side. If I sort of used it directly, I would then get that this combination is greater than zero, and then I can move the A over 4G to the other side and get this. But you see, I've added some symbols here. I put a hat on the entropy and I put a squiggle on the inequality. The reason is, in this inequality, there are various divergences that I haven't been careful about. So there's a statement that, um, there are various lines of argument that suggest that the generalized entropy of a region, so this thing, for example, A over 4G plus SQFTI, is actually a UV finite quantity. And the basic reason is that the QFT entropy has various UV divergences that we've seen in some formulas before. But actually, those divergences are supposed to cancel against renormalizations of Newton's constant. Here, I've said Newton's constant to one. But if I had a G Newton here, uh, the matter fields uh, lead to renormalizations of G Newton um, that actually make this a finite quantity. They're all, so there are those arguments, also arguments from ADSCFT that say this is a UV finite quantity. But here, I have other combinations which are not expected to be UV finite. So this is UV divergent. This has divergences, this has divergences, and the sign is off, so they don't really cancel. Um, so the reason why I put this hat and this squiggle is that you actually need to be very careful. You can't just go from Faraki lead to this inequality. You need to UV regulate your problem, be very careful about divergences. I've left out all that analysis. It's in the paper if you're curious. But if you do that, you get what is morally the correct inequality, which is that the finite part of the entropy on I, so you strip away the UV divergent pieces, that thing is um, roughly bigger than A over 4. Roughly bigger because of excluded terms that are subleading compared to the A over 4 term here. So this is not an exact inequality. What it's telling you conceptually is that um, you had better have a lot of entropy in region I if you want to include an island there. Because otherwise, both these things are going to cost you. Like, let's say, um, you know, I union R, this entropy like factorized into the entropy of I and the entropy of R. But this piece costs you, the QFT entropy on I can cost you. So this is never going to be less than this. Um, so this is just kind of reflecting that, uh, that state of affairs. Okay, this is kind of an interesting, it's like a Bekenstein violating condition, sort of, because Bekenstein bound, it's not really, but it kind of looks like it. You can ask, is this violated in our universe? This is a total tangent, but it's kind of fun. You can ask, is it, can you get, cone? compute the quantum field theory entropy of region I. And if, for thermal magnetization, that's the only reason I'm pointing it out, uh, but it seems to be true. I think it's unrelated to islands and I'll explain on the next slide why that is, but it's still kind of curious that this bound is violated at that scale. There's no reason that it had to pop out. So it got this, uh, uh, this uh, one TV, is it somehow related to collider or something? To a collider? Yeah. Um, I, I don't really know what the meaning of, of this computation is. It's just, it's, it's kind of like what some people sometimes call the WIMP miracle, where you're, oh, you're okay. thinking about dark matter candies. You do some computations and some models. And for some reason, the electroweak scale came out of the computation when it didn't have to. This is a similar thing. I mean, this bound and this physics doesn't really have anything to do with the electroweak scale. But if you check to see where it's violated, it seems to be at the electroweak scale. Mm -hmm. um, but I have no idea what the implications of that are, if any. It's probably just a curiosity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what I want to highlight is, and was one of the main points of this paper, is that these conditions are independent of region R. And in fact, they're quite powerful in simple examples because the boundary of region I has to be in the intersection of the two. So then you can go and check various space times. For example, here's a picture of FRW cosmology. You can get this is like radiation domination. Here's the quantum normal region. That is this first condition here. And here's the Bekenstein violating uh, region. That's when this inequality is satisfied. And notice they have no overlap. 
I mean, they have some overlap, which I drew in green, but this is near the singularity, so it's not trustworthy. They have no overlap. Um, so this space-time cannot host an island for any uh, radiation region R. Even if you had a disconnected space-time that you entangled with this one, you can do whatever you want. There's never going to be an island because these necessary conditions are not satisfied. All right. Um, and I want to emphasize that here now, because we have these conditions just on region I, we can do this computation in, in general dimensions. So on the paper, for example, we do four, four dimensional computations of these entropies. So this is really 4D FRW. We're not doing the 2D um, setup I was talking about before. Okay, another thing you do is very closely related example. Let's say you have radiation domination plus a positive cosmological constant. Okay, late times, we know the positive CC dominates and you ask some code to desitter. In that space time, if you plot these regions, again, they have no overlap. So this space time also can't really host an island. Okay. Now, this is most useful for negative results. You are the examples where you don't have islands. Yeah, these are examples where you don't have islands. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and, and as I was about to say, these two examples are really most useful for these negative uh, uh, these negative conclusions because they're necessary conditions. If they're satisfied, it doesn't necessarily imply you have an island, but if they're not satisfied, you know for sure that you can't have an island, okay? So, but let's look at some re situations where they are satisfied. Now we have a uh, crunching cosmology. So this can be radiation domination plus a negative cosmological constant, something like that. Uh, that will crunch at late times. And now if you look at the quantum normal regions and the Bex's violating regions, they actually have an overlap out here where you can potentially have an island. And in this example, uh, we're actually able to construct situations where you did have an island. Island region was this whole interval and it ended here. And the example was basically by putting the matter in this space time in a thermal field double with matter in some disconnected universe. In that situation, if you compute the entropy in the disconnected universe, uh, you'll find that there's an island uh, in this universe with endpoint in this overlap region. So while these are only necessary conditions, in any example that we looked at where they had overlap, uh, it seemed sufficient. We could construct then an example uh, that actually had an island that was hosted um, in, this, in this overlap region. Okay, a closely related example is um, JT gravity. So this was still, you know, four dimensional, but now let's talk about a two dimensional situation is um, JT gravity in two dimensional de Sitter space. JT gravity in two dimensional de Sitter space um, has as solutions, things that are very similar to Schwarzschild de Sitter in higher dimensions. So that space time or a piece of that space time looks like the following. So this is an inflating region here. This is ordinary like de Sitter scribe plus. The dilaton is going to plus infinity here. But here I drew these little squiggles. Why did I do that? That's because the dilaton is going to minus infinity here. You interpret this as the black hole singularity. So this is like a cosmological horizon here. And this is like a black hole horizon. And the reason is, again, because the solution is like a dimensional reduction of Schwarzschild to Sitter in higher dimensions. In that, that case, the transverse sphere is shrinking as you go into the black hole singularity and is growing as you go to the future of the Sitter. Okay. And you can plot again, when are these regions satisfied? And their overlap is a tiny sliver way out here. And you can again find, uh, if you computed, let's say the uh, entropy of radiation for some region here, um, you could find an island uh, with an endpoint here. And this is very similar to the examples I've been talking about. Like I said, this is Schwarzschild de Sitter. So it's black holes and de Sitter. We've already talked about black holes in ADS, black holes in flat space. So this is in the same sort of moral uh, class or same universality class of examples. This is just an island that appears in the interior of a black hole. It's uh, really that kind of island. So if I wanted to draw these overlap regions for the CJHS model or for black holes in ADS, it would look like this. It would look like a tiny sliver out here and uh, you would have an island with endpoint there for a region outside the black hole. So this example is just like those. Now, in the next slide, we'll see why, um, one of the reasons why we were doing this example. Actually, this example and this collapsing cosmology are very similar for the basic reason that an interior of a black hole is a lot like a collapsing cosmology. 
okay, if you just kind of expand the metric near the singularity, it looks like the metric near the singularity would collapse in cosmology. And we don't think we live in a collapsing cosmology. For as far as we know, for measurements, uh, we're entering a desitter phase, and we don't have any reason to believe that we'll end in a collapse. Um, so is this at all relevant in, in our universe? Well, it might be, and it might be in the following sense. So in a picture of um, a universe that's populated by Coleman de Lucha bubble nucleation, which people sometimes call a multiverse, which uh, I don't like that name, but just to connect to things people may have seen. Um, there, the picture is that most of future infinity will end up crunching, basically because the way Coleman de Lucha bubble nucleation works is you have transitions between metastable vacua, and those transitions want to continuously lower the cosmological constant. And as it's doing that, eventually, unless it ends in a stable bubble like this, this can be like a super symmetric flat, you know, zero, exactly zero cosmological constant bubble. Unless it luckily ends up in one of those, which is believed to be stable, it will end up crunching. It'll keep discharging cosmological constant until it ends up in negative cosmological constant, and then it'll crunch. So we can then imagine we're some observer in such a stable flat bubble. Again, ours, we seem to have a tiny positive CC, but let's say we were in some stable flat bubble. You could have even made this a desitter bubble that's like long lived and metastable. Um, and let's say you want to measure the entropy out here in region R. Then it's possible that you have island regions which are outside your observable horizon and are capturing um, regions of crunching cosmologies. So very much like this black hole example. Uh, you can imagine having an island in the crunching cosmologies. And this picture I've drawn is, drawn is actually an example um, in a 2D model. Okay, it's actually very hard to do a computation with Coleman de Lucha bubble nucleation in three plus one dimensions. We could not uh, come close to doing that computation. But you can do the following toy model in one plus one dimensions, which is put JT gravity in two dimensional consider everywhere here outside of these orange lines. And here, across these orange lines, glue it to some flat space theory of gravity. It doesn't really matter which, let's say you do JT gravity in flat space or the CGHS model. You kind of glue them across here. You do your junction conditions, so you have some global, well-defined space time. And then if you actually compute the entropy of radiation here, you'll find this island region um, out here, OK? Um, and this is supposed to be sort of evocative of potentially having island regions in neighboring crunching bubbles uh, in a picture of um, a multiverse or a Coleman dilution bubble nuclei. So that's, a, that's one way this crunching cosmologies might be relevant to something potentially in our observable universe. Any questions about that? Okay, it seems like I have around 20 minutes. Um, so I'll just say a few things kind of quickly. You can ask, okay, we've been computing islands in various space times. Like, what, you know, what does this all mean? Like, learned, but the structure of quantum gravity, things like that, great, we reproduced the page curve, but what, what have we really learned at a deeper level? So I wanna to connect to a few ideas. Uh, which I won't elaborate on too much. One of them is the idea of entanglement wedge reconstruction. And I'll, say, I'll kind of give a few steps of what that looks like. The basic idea is that the interior of the black hole is actually encoded in the exterior. So this is roughly like our modern understanding of what was called black hole complementarity, um, or more recently, um, what's ideas related to entanglement creating space time, or ER equals EPR. There's some statement that this island is encoded in the radiation out here. So I wanna quickly say what that means roughly. And what that means is it used some ideas from quantum information. So here I've written the island formula. It says that the entropy in quantum gravity uh, is equal to the entropy in QFT of this R union I region plus the gravitational entropy. And from this, there's an argument by these authors, Jeffers, Lipwitz, Maldesena, and Sue, um, 
that says that the relative entropy in quantum gravity equals the relative entropy in QFT. And this is actually the first step. I'm, I'm just being very schematic and putting references so people can, can read about it if they're, if they're curious. This is the first step uh, of arguments for entanglement wedge reconstruction. Once you have this equality of relative entropies, it was used by various authors in the context of ADS CFT um, to argue that you can reconstruct the entanglement wedge in the anti desitter bulk purely from the boundary. Here we can apply those ideas just in the evaporating black hole space time. We're not assuming holography or anything like that. If we apply those same ideas, what we learn is that we can reconstruct operators in the island region uh, purely by operators in region R. What that means is for some states I in what's called the code subspace. So code subspace you could think of as like perturbative excitations on a fixed semi-classical background. Then operators on region I um, that act on that state uh, are equal to operators just on region R that act on that state. So whatever manipulations an observer would be doing back here, observer could equivalently do. Okay, so that's the sense in which the interior is. In. What that allows you to say is, um, so it allows you to say various things. You could think of space time as being like a quantum error correcting code or what have you. But one particular thing is it allows you to extend an argument, various arguments in ADS CFT to the context of just evaporating black holes. So um, this is something that uh, is work in progress with uh, Daniel Harlow. And it is, um, you could think of it as an extension of, of work of um, Harlow and Aguri, where they use entanglement wedge reconstruction and ADS CFT to rule out global symmetries in the bulk. This is one of the folk theorems of quantum gravity that quantum gravity should not have any global symmetries. The very heuristic arguments are that um, black holes can't track uh, charge related to global symmetries. And you know, they made these arguments particularly precise even for discrete symmetries in the context of ADS CFT. And the basic argument is, is very simple. Um, let's say you have a symmetry in a charged operator. So this is just some black hole space time. This green thing is some charged operator. And here I've drawn the entanglement wedges. So the um, pink region is the entanglement wedge of the black hole system, which I've called S. And you could think of as some lower dimensional system, let's say. The yellow region is the entanglement wedge of the full radiation region. Now, if you have some full quantum gravitational description that is given by, um, or sorry, a full description of the evaporating black hole that's given by, let's say, you know, quantum field theory on S union R, so this whole red slice, then you can break up your symmetry generator on this full system in this way. So you have some symmetry generator U of G, um, and you can break it up into pieces. So if you had, for example, a continuous symmetry, the another current would allow you to break it up into these pieces. So it acts on S, and then you can break up the radiation into little subsets. That's what this is. And these U edges are just some UV dependent stuff that patches up the overlaps. <clears throat> and now you can quickly reach a contradiction. Now the entangle wedge of the union of these Rs is this yellow region. But the entanglement wedge of any of these individual R, R1, R2, R3, is actually none of the interior region here. It's only these gray regions. So you really need the union of all the Rs to recover this entanglement wedge. So because the individual ones don't see this region, that means this charged operator, it commutes uh, with all these uh, unitaries U. It computes the UG of S because it's space-like separated from this pink region here. And it computes, commutes to these UG Rs uh, because it's also space like separated, the entanglement wedge of any of these individual ones doesn't have any of this stuff here. So if it commutes with all the pieces, then it commutes with the full, full thing, U of G, and in particular, G A phi. So in particular, it's not charged under the symmetry generated by U. Okay, this was also a bit brief, but um, this paper should be out soon, and it's um, based on arguments uh, in this paper. And the kind of final thing, so we had some, some fun with thinking about the, these ideas and what they mean in, in a potentially even deeper sense. 
And once you start thinking about that, you start realizing a, a few things. One is, you know, the Bekenstein Hawking law and replica wormholes themselves, they come from the Euclidean gravity path integral. Okay, and if all if it's true, if the Bekenstein Hawking law is true and replica wormholes are correct and give you the correct entropy, uh, then global symmetries aren't allowed. Like that's that's what I was trying to argue on the last slide. But these results are sometimes incorrect. We talked about the RST model, the CGHS model, and I said if you canonically quantize this theory, uh, then the Hawking curve is the correct curve. The entropy of the radiation increases forever. And you have remnants, meaning the Bekenstein Hawking law is not true. Very, very small black holes can have arbitrarily large number of states. And in those theories, global symmetries are allowed. In particular, if I took RST and I added a CFT with N free fermions or N free bosons, um, there'd be a flavor symmetry of those free bosons and fermions. And if I canonically quantize, that flavor symmetry would be preserved. So um, there are counterexamples to our belief in these principles. We don't believe that that's how quantum gravity in our universe behaves, because these examples are a little weird, they're not holographic, but they do exist. And global symmetries are, are allowed. So we can ask, when then do we expect these things to be true? They're not true in these examples. But somehow we tend to believe they're true. So what, when, are the, when are they actually correct? In particular, when is the Euclidean gravity path integral correct? Because that's the thing that gives you all these results. And the proposal, I'll say the short version first, is that Euclidean gravity is just holography. Okay, there isn't really any difference between the two. And if you're assuming Euclidean gravity, meaning you're assuming that the beckinson hawking law gives you and replica wormholes, if you're assuming those things are true, then you have to commit yourself to the fact that uh, your theory is holographic. So in particular, the path integral correctly computes, let's say the black hole entropy or other von Neumann entropies, if and only if the theory you're considering is UV completable into a holographic theory. And in that case, the entropies you're computing are those of the holographic theory. Okay, the reason why one has to word it in this more careful way is you could think of models like um, CGHS, let's say, in two different ways for Einstein gravity and ADS3 even in two different ways. One is as a UV complete model. One is as a low energy effective theory that is to be completed into a holographic theory. Um, so that's, that's sort of just, um, is just assuming holography. So to just put a little bit of evidence for this, you know, what is one of the important things that you think gravity pathing does? It computes the Bekenstein Hawking law. The way it does it is by allowing the circle to cap off in the interior, right? This is like the Euclidean jumper, the thermal circle at the horizon. If you canonically put these sorts of geometry, it makes the Euclidean path integral um, different than the Lorentzian path integral. Definitely examples like uh, CGHS or JT where you can compute exactly. They're just two different ways to quantize the theory. And so you can ask, well, when the hell, why, why are there two different ways? When the hell is this the same as the Lorentzian path integral? And uh, our proposal is that the reason this is a reasonable thing to do is because this thermal circle, if your theory is holographic, which is how we reconcile all these ideas, then the true thermal circle really lives far away, like at the ADS boundary or some asymptotic boundary. And then it's fine if it caps off in the interior. You should only require that the thing be a thermal circle in the microscopic theory, in the boundary description far away. And then what it does in the interior, you know, that, that, part, um, that part is not important. You don't need to preserve the fact that it's a thermal circle in the interior. And there are further more precise arguments from the point of view of let's say um, modular invariance or things like that from the boundary perspective that say that this is a reasonable thing to do. Okay, so I'll just summarize and then stop for, for questions. Um, the first thing I talked about is replica wormholes from the point of view of the Euclidean gravity path integral, and these being the objects that lead to a unitary page curve in black hole evaporation. This mechanism I think is general, these wormholes should exist in any number of dimensions for generic gravitational theories. They may not be on-shell configurations. Um, in the JT gravity and ADS2 case, they, 
um, we did argue that they were actually on shell configurations and they dominated the, um, the path integral. But in general, they should exist potentially off shell configurations. So it'd be nice to understand their role much more generally. We analyze the CGHS and RST models. In general, if you cannot quantize them, they hide information, meaning they have remnants. And you can imagine modifying the model by quantizing it from the Euclidean gravity perspective, meaning some over topology. In that case, we argued that you get a unitary page curve. Fully defining the model this way is not something we've done. And um, it, you know, it's, it'd be nice to understand how, if that's even possible. We just did a saddle point analysis. Um, you know, looking ahead to understanding stuff more generally, I'll talk about some consistency conditions for islands that need to be true in general space times, including cosmology, and these conditions are independent of region R. And then I talk about some ideas of how this picture is a lot like ADS-CFT, and then if you think carefully about the analogy with ADS-CFT, you can derive various statements, like the fact that global symmetries are inconsistent um, with these ideas that we currently have of how information is recovered from the interior hole. And then finally, there's a proposal, uh, a slogan of which can be that Euclidean gravity is just holography. So the only time you're allowed to take seriously the results of the Euclidean gravity path integral, um, you should basically expect that the things it's computing are quantities in a holographic UV completion of your theory. So not, for example, something that would happen in asymptotic safety or some other such non-holographic picture. OK, I'll stop there and take any questions. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you, Edgar, for your contribution and very nice talk, uh, which I will believe that it will be helpful for all the students and researchers, those who are working and those who are not working for them as well, because it is quite clear from your discussion. And uh, um, I don't know how many people are here right now because it is already late in Germany and I don't know, like whoever there you can ask, want to uh, ask question, please ask. Otherwise, like uh, for other uh, students, those who will see this talk after posting in YouTube, you can write to him personally because uh, like, uh, I can understand uh, between the time differences in in different time zones. So you can write to him, he can uh, give you the answers. But those who are here, like three people, you can, if you want to ask, please ask. And you want to say something? I am just speaking continuously. <laughs> Me? Yes. No, I think I said uh, roughly everything I wanted to say. Yeah. Um, but if there aren't questions, we can um, we can just cut it off, and I'm happy to take questions. Maybe I, I I will write to you sometime because uh, uh, regarding this uh, your paper islands in cosmology, so we are planning to do something regarding that, which is not exactly related, but yeah, somehow related. So we got something good results, and uh, we are like planning to put in archive. But maybe I will write to you sometime to discuss some. Um, I have a, a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I am Alessandro from Florence in Italy. Uh, I have a, as, as you probably know, there is another uh, possi possibility to, for, to resolve the information paradox, the, the, the fuzzball uh, proposal. Uh, we, we, we have we, we did a talk from... Um, from Matur uh, the la last, uh, do you, what do you think about it? Do you think uh, in, in, this, uh, in this proposal, the, the radiation is uh, simply the radiation of a piece of coal, uh, well, the, where the, the bound of the fuzzball is uh, as simply um, a temperature, and then uh, it radiates, that's it, uh, as a, a piece of coal. What do you think about it? Uh, I don't think I have anything particularly intelligent to say about it because I haven't studied the, the, the fuzzball paradigm carefully. I think the place in which um, the two pictures might become more different is the experience of an infalling observer, which is 
not something I really talked about here. I was always talking about, you know, the experience from the outside and computing entities from the outside. And there, all the results are consistent with, you know, at the level of words saying the black hole is like a piece of coal and its entropy is, is unitary, it goes up and goes back down. Um, the, the primary difference, I think, is going to be how one understands the experience of an infalling observer. Um, so I don't, I don't really have um, something intelligent to say about it. I just want to point out that one, um, you know, one sharp, I guess one sharp difference, the fuzzball case is you sort of uh, explicitly need what's happening is unitary. And I think that sort of sidesteps a question you can ask, which is, let's not focus on the microscopic description, let's just talk about the low energy theory. And why is, if you do a Hawking style calculation, why is low energy theory getting the answer so wrong? Um, that seems to imply uh, a serious breakdown of low energy effective field theory. Um, and of course, you know, the fuzzball picture is also, um, it, it, it's similar, it's saying that, you know, you, should, you shouldn't really think about the black hole as a smooth thing that changes the Planck scale. It can be, you know, the constituents you use to build the hole are macroscopic and they go up to the horizon radius. But you sort of have to invoke um, those degrees of freedom to start talking about the resolution. And what I don't fully understand yet is how that can be, cons right how a paradigm kind of incorporates all, all these ideas. Because here you never had to invoke the microscopic um, degrees of freedom or picture. Just from the perspective of the Euclidean gravity path integral, you're able to get the fact that the evolution is unitary. Now I said at the end that um, the using the Euclidean gravity path integral is like assuming holography. So you sort of are assuming something about the microscopic description. Um, but that, okay, that was a proposal. Um, it, is, it would still be nice to understand in particular why this Euclidean gravity path integral knows about the microstates of, of the black hole. Um, so I'm just trying to talk about a way one can start trying to sort of reconcile these two pictures. They are reconcilable. And one way to connect them is to understand how the Euclidean gravity path integral knows about the microstates. Maybe through that you learn something about the microstates. And through that, you can compare it to the fuzzball picture of what the microstates are like and what they're doing. But I haven't thought seriously about that other, about the fuzzball perspective. So I don't have anything intelligent to say about it. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Sure. So uh, Abhinash, you want to ask anything? Uh, not really. I, I don't have anything to say, but uh, since I'm particularly interested in this island formalism, this was a very enlightening talk. So thank you for that. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So, All right. um, uh, so we have to finish it right now. So stay safe and healthy. And uh, uh, you are operating from home, I think, because yeah, yeah, yeah. looks like home. So I think soon we can able to go for uh, go to our departments and all and yeah, <laughs> study from there. So I don't know. But in Germany, the situation is quite getting worse right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I heard that uh, they are going to be locked down uh, if it is not working within ten days. Then they will go for lockdown for some few months. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's getting worse in many parts in the states as well. I guess it's the general trend in the northern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. I can understand. So, anyways, and I'm I'm uh, very happy that you have given this talk, and I feel that you also feel very happy to discuss with us. And uh, I'm hopeful that you will get emails from different people, those who will see this talk, because this is for everyone. And uh, since you have covered the whole phenomena. So I feel that this will be very, very helpful for students, postdocs and researchers. And uh, thank you very much for your contribution. See you, bye. Bye. <laughs>